Okay, I'm going to call the uh, Finance Committee meeting of March 26, 2019, to order at five minutes after two. And uh, committee member Lynn Griesmer will be participating remotely because physical attendance would be unreasonably difficult under 940 CMR 2910-5, specifically due to geographic distance. This information shall be recorded in the meeting minutes. Lynn, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Um, and I guess the other question is, is there anybody? It's still there, Lynn. <laughs> Lynn, are you there? I am. Okay, can, and everybody can hear Lynn? Okay, so uh, we have established that um, uh, Everybody can hear, so let the record reflect that Councilor Griesmer's attendance why a speakerphone can be heard by all present at the meeting. All votes taken during the meeting will be, by, uh, where there's remote participation, must be by roll call vote. So I'm going to um, immediately go to agenda item two and thank the superintendent and the uh, budget director from the uh, regional schools um, who are going to uh, make a presentation of the budget, um, which we then refer to, um, have to hold a public hearing on and then refer to the council. So um, thank you for coming and I appreciate you being here. Now I'll let, turn it over to you. Thank you for, ha thank you for having us. Um, so I'm just going to briefly introduce the process that led to this budget presentation. Um, so uh, we are a four-town regional school district, grades 7 through 12. And as such, we have two um, parallel processes that are related but not identical. One is to develop our budget based on um, what the needs of the school district are. And the other is to figure out how, that, how the funding needed would be financed between the four communities. Uh, as some of you are aware from attending four town meetings, that's uh, a complicated set of puzzle pieces to, to put together. I want to compliment Mr. Mangano for his work on that every year. It seems like we have different pieces and somehow it came together. Um, but I also want to note from the school committee perspective that in January they had an initial budget presentation. In February there was an additional budget presentation with a public hearing where anyone in the public was uh, given time to come up and speak not during the traditional public comment period, but actually through a hearing process uh, to comment on the regional budget. And this budget was passed by the regional school committee as well as the assessment method passed and voted unanimously by the regional school committee on March 12th, so just uh, two weeks ago. I think at this point I'll turn it over to Ms. Mangano to talk through uh, overview of the budget. Uh, I can speak to any of the ads, cuts, and, and spe specifics, and then we're open to any feedback and questions that we might receive. All right, so I'm just going to go through the packet that I uh, sent out to you, and there should be a hard copy in front of you. Uh, so the budget that was approved is for $32,167,342. Um, the assessment to Amherst is $16,444,279, um, which is just under the guidance that we received from the town at 2.49%. I'm going to flip over to page four. So as we go through this, I'll spend a little more time, um, in particular this first year, going over some of our summary charts and how they're organized, because we use those every year, and it'll just be, I think, a good practice. Um, but before we get there on page four, one chart we put together every year that I think is important for your advocacy and when you think about the regional school district um, is this chart on state aid reimbursements. So we break it into two sections, and these are the two two of our major revenue sources that are uh, typically underfunded at the state level. Um, the first one is charter tuition reimbursement, and the other one is regional transportation aid reimbursement. And so the way this is organized is you have the fiscal year on the left. The mandate just means if you follow the law and it's fully funded, what would our reimbursement be? And then next to that is what we actually received, um, and then the difference between the two. So in total, you can see in any given year, we're somewhere between 300000 and $500,000 under um, what we should receive based on the law, but because the, the line item at the state is underfunded, we're not getting that full amount. Um, so, you know, these are two areas that I know the school committee really focuses on when they're talking to our legislators. Um, 
and if you ever get the question raised, what could you do to help the regional school district, these are two areas that would really help. I could add just briefly, uh, last week there was a hearing which was well reported on uh, local papers as well as the Globe about uh, education funding in the Commonwealth moving forward. And one of the things that um, sometimes gets lost, particularly is the regional transportation. So the short story on regional transportation is for districts that agree to form into a region, which means there's a shared governance model of representatives from all, community, all communities on a school committee. Um, the carrot, so to speak, is that uh, there's funding from the state to support the transportation needs because it's a larger geographic area, likely a larger geographic area um, to cover, to do that. And the state uh, multiple times, including currently with the current governor, has encouraged districts to regionalize. We have a high number of districts as compared to other states uh, in the country. And so I think one of the ironies for me, sound a little political here, is that while there's uh, such a push from the state to regionalize, the actual carrot on the other end of regionalization um, continues to be underfunded. And some of that's because there's not that many regional districts and they don't live in huge population centers. So from a um, state representative and senator uh, perspective, um, there's people who are elected officials who don't have a regional district in their, you know, in their constituent uh, group. So it is something we care an awful lot about and um, our school committee has been heavily involved in regional advocacy. I know there's a bill right now in the House um, to fully fund regional um, transportation at the State House, I should say. Um, so just wanted to put a little wrinkle for those of you who are new to a regional district, why do we get regional transportation? But it's sort of connected to the organization of a regional school district. Do you want any questions just along the way or do you want to go through it quickly? I'm fine with questions along the way. Uh, so I just have a question on um, if you receive the mandate on transportation, do, is that paying for almost all of transportation? Is it paying a particular percent? So I just want to know how the... Yeah, um, so, so what it pays for is eligible costs. So it doesn't include special education transportation. So it's only regular, um, like big yellow school bus transportation. Um, and it covers the costs it, for students that are um, transported over 1.5 miles. So we do a fancy calculation every year for reporting purposes where we have to break down what that cost is and that's what the state bases the reimbursement on. All right, so I'm gonna go to the next page which is actually number nine. I'm gonna skip a couple of these pages which are just sort of informational. So page number nine is our revenue budget. Um, and as Dr. Morris mentioned, this is sort of part of the process of figuring out how we're gonna fund the, the, the overall budget. Um, and so this table is broken into four different sections. The top section are our state aid revenue sources, then member town assessments, then reserves, and then other, which that doesn't really fit into the, either of those three categories. Um, and so at the top, you'll see chapter 70. That's very predictable. Um, it's disappointing, but it's predictable every year. Um, it doesn't ever go down, or at least hasn't since I've been here, here and it kind of creeps up every year a little teeny bit. Um, transportation reimbursement is the next one uh, that has a, a value for FY20. And so we're proje projecting um, this amount based on our cost this year, but overall we're expecting transportation aid to be level funded um, at, the, at the state level. Uh, Medicaid reimbursement, we complete a report. Uh, we get reimbursed by the state for certain costs that we um, incur on behalf of students for medical purposes, um, and we get a, a chunk of money back for those expenditures. Um, and charter reimbursement is the next one down, 172000 That dropped quite a bit this year because we're being conservative based on um, the governor's proposed change to the charter reimbursement formula. Um, he's, it hasn't been approved, but he's basically changing the reimbursement formula from a six-year reimbursement to a three-year reimbursement. Um, that has some issues, but that's actually not what's impacting us the most. The, the thing that's impacting us the most is that the way they're calculating the um, reimbursement, instead of it being based on your cost is this year one and your cost is this year two, and they reimburse you for that difference, however much you increased. Um, instead, they're looking at enrollment, and they're saying, all right, your enrollment uh, for the coming year, is it higher than any of the prior five years? They're looking at the previous five years and saying your enrollment for the coming year has to be higher than the max of any of those five years. Um, if it is higher than the max of any of those five years, you'll get a reimbursement um, average cost per student for how much you're above that max. Um, if it's not higher than that max, then you get no reimbursement. Uh, so because our tuition this coming year, our enrollment, we actually had a good year with enrollment um, last year where our charter tuition stayed relatively flat. 
we're not expecting it to be a lot above any of our prior five-year maxes. Um, we're not expecting a lot of reimbursement under this no new formula. Um, I think the estimate of roughly how much less we're getting is somewhere in the ballpark of 100,000, um, but I can get you the exact number. But it's, this new formula would not be positive for us if it goes into effect for next year. So I know you jump, this jumps it ahead a little bit, but just to point out the amount or the place in the budget where the other side of charter is the right. charge. So charters um, has the two sides of the coin. So the, the revenue, the reimbursement is right here. And in the expense side of the budget, I'll point out um, where it's grouped, but there's a charter tuition expense in the uh, expense side of the budget. That so, so in any given year, if our charter tuition goes up a lot, it's bad for the expenses, but we'll get more reimbursement to help offset that. If our charter enrollment goes down, it's good for our expenses, but that means we're probably going to get less reimbursement as well. So um, they sort of net each other out. Okay. Dorothy? I think I heard that you would, um, having in the high school um, Chinese, that you either had already instituted that or that you were do going to do it, and that this might lure some people back to Amherst High School. Has any of that started yet? So we've had a Chinese program. So what was new is in last year's budget, we added an additional uh, 0.2 FTE to round out our program. So um, the short story is Chinese had, uh, we've always had the program, well, not always, but we've had it for many years. It's waxed and waned in terms of how comprehensive it was. Since we did have a number of students returning who were part of a school that um, taught Chinese immersion, we had to adjust our programming to fit their needs. So families reached out to us um, to be really clear, not the other way around, um, and talked about what their needs would be. They had students that wanted to return to the, or wanted to come to the regional school system, but they also had um, interest in having Chinese program that we didn't have in place. So we did reconfigure our Chinese program to fit those needs uh, and continue, we'll continue that this year. So the next section down after state aid is member town assessments, and we'll talk about the assessment formula in a little bit, but um, that's every year some allocation based on enrollment and, and other measures that are agreed upon um, splits the overall assessment among the four member towns. Um, below that is reserve, so regional schools have something called excess and deficiency. So um, on, the, you know, on the town side, if you don't spend money, it eventually goes into your free cash and possibly a stabilization fund. Um, on the region, for regional districts, any unspent money at the end of the year goes into an excess and deficiency account that has to be certified by the Department of Revenue every year. Um, so any unspent funds from our expense budget or if we bring in more revenues than what we budgeted, um, the sum of those two goes into this excess and deficiency account. And for regional school districts, we're capped at 5% of our operating and capital budget. So that reserve account can never get above that 5%. So every year there's some amount that we pull out of that E&D to support the, the upcoming year's budget. And then usually there's money we put back in at the end of that year. And then the last source um, and the other section is just some interest revenue that we um, get on our bank accounts. So those four groups make up our overall budget um, that we discussed at the beginning. Any questions on the revenue side of the budget before I move to the expense side? See none. Okay. Well, then I assume you'll speak up if you have any. I'm sorry we're doing this without you having the benefit of the paper that we're all looking at. I have it. Oh, good. Thank you. It was shared. It's easier. Better up there, yeah. All right, so this is similar uh, oriented to the revenue side, but it's um, the expenses. It's broken into two sections. So the top section are payroll accounts, and the bottom section we just call expense accounts, but it's everything essentially that's not payroll. Um, and then you have the different cost centers under each of them. Um, usually there's a match, there's a payroll cost center for regular education and an expense cost center for regular education. That's true for most of the categories. Um, so in payroll, the overall increase was 458,000. That's um, essentially from our collective bargaining agreements and the annual um, step and cola that the, our union um, employees get each year. So for FY20, it's one and a half percent is what was agreed upon. Below that, expense accounts, there's a few areas that I'll point out. Um, special education, we have a pretty large increase, 193,000 from FY19 um, to FY20. That's in that change column that's shaded a, a light gray color. And that's just due to, we have more students that are out of district. Um, we've had a, a little bit of a bump in terms of out of district placements, and that's what's driving that number going up. Um, other programs, which is right below that. Other programs is the section of our budget where charter um, choice tuition are held, 
and also vocational tuition. And so you can see that's going down quite a bit. We've had good luck with our charter tuition and choice tuition staying pretty, uh, ch charter tuition staying flat. Our choice tuition, which is a slightly different program, but it, it works the same way in terms of tuition ex is exchanged between districts. Um, that it went down and our vocational tuition went down. Um, we, had, we had a peak of about 50 students in vocational programs two years ago. Um, we saw a drop of 10 uh, this past year and we're expecting another drop going forward. So we're seeing that tuition part of our budget come back down, which is a good thing. And then the other two sections I'll point out, health insurance. You can see large decreases in health insurance. Those are following really large increases in health insurance the prior year when our premiums went up uh, between 20 and 25 percent um, and, and the surcharge was tacked on. So it's coming back down for a few reasons. One, the surcharge went away, so that's <coughs> coming off. Um, we weren't sure that was going to go away so quickly, but it did, which is, is good for our budget. Uh, we also are seeing that our enrollment is changing a little bit. We have fewer people enrolling in PPOs and more people enrolling in HMOs, which is, um, from a cost perspective, HMOs are less expensive. Um, and our overall enrollment is just down. Uh, I don't know if it's because of the plan design changes that were made, but um, between all three districts, our enrollment is down a little bit, so the, the cost for the number of plans we're paying for is lower. Can, can I just ask yeah. on that, can you analyze that? Is that people um, putting their dependent on another plan or putting their spouse on another plan? Because I, I, I mean, I, I don't need an yeah. answer right now, there, but... Um, we can analyze... There's one trend that we did notice sort of along those lines is we have an opt-out program in the town of Amherst. So if you have a spouse that has a plan and you're with us and you decide to go to their plan, we have an incentive where we pay you, I think it's $3,000 a year to go to that plan. Um, we did see increases, quite, uh, pretty significant increases in those opt-out programs. Um, I think there was somewhere between seven and eight in each district um, that decided to opt out. Employees now pay a share of the premium? Yeah, so for, Yeah, so you've put in a a sweetener for right, someone so to HMOs, leave. And, yeah. So HMOs, I believe employees pay 20% and the district pays 80. And PPOs, uh, the employee pays 25% and the district pays 75. Um, below that, you'll see other insurance and benefits, $92,000 increase, that's our pension. Um, we belong to Hampshire County, just like the town. And, and that cost generally goes up about $100,000 every year. And the last one I'll focus on is the additions and reductions. So the way our uh, budget works every year is that we don't, any additions or reductions to programming that we're proposing, we don't put it into the cost centers above because we want to isolate it for you all so you can see what's being proposed and what's been approved. So all the additions and reductions are isolated in this number down below the 300 and 1,000, which we'll talk about uh, what, what goes into that number. Um, but every year you'll see a number there. Um, usually it's negative because we're having to make reductions in the past. That's typically what it's been this year because of the health insurance and the tuitions, uh, which are moving in positive directions. Um, we were able to add uh, a little bit to our programming. Uh, the next page I won't spend a ton of time on, but this is just a, a bar chart that we put together every year um, that compares 10 years uh, difference between the budget back then and the budget today and how much each of these categories comprises of the overall budget. Um, I think the two areas that are noteworthy are other programs, again, you'll see that was only about 4.87% of the budget back in FY10, and now it's up to almost 8% of the budget, and that's really because we had a um, charter school that was only K-6 before expand um, to high school. So instead of just having one charter school at the high school level, we now have two charter schools at the high school level, um, and that drove a lot of that increase. And then down below, you'll see other insurance and benefits. Um, and, and retiree health insurance, those two both have grown to be a, a larger portion of the budget. And again, that's due to the Hampshire County pension system really growing quite a bit every year um, and our retiree health insurance pool growing every year, which is sort of pr what's been predicted in the past and so we are seeing it in our numbers. And so I'm gonna pass it off to Dr. Morris who's gonna talk about the ads and cuts a little bit. So I'll just briefly go um, down some of the key ones that, um, so in terms of adjustments, uh, we're now fully at one-to-one, uh, -one, which means that every student who enters our regional school district um, is offered a Chromebook that they have and um, can take home and do work on during the school day as well as at home. Um, so since we're, we're at the one, the, we finally have our 12th graders, which we're, we built up from seventh, having one-to-one, -one, uh, we could reduce the cost of adding a grade level every year. Uh, we did some consolidation of software programs, which helped. Um, and just also some, some minor adjustments. 
In terms of additions, um, significant numbers of them are based on the students that come to us, that are coming to us or, or are here. So you'll see a school adjustment counselor that's related to special education. We have a, um, the sixth grade class across the four member towns uh, has a number of students who have high levels of special needs. So the seven increase of, the increase of seven paraeducators, it's actually, um, there's more than seven paraeducators needed for the incoming class. It's actually, we've been able to reduce other places to make that number lower, but we knew this years ahead. We knew about the incoming class and the needs of the, of the students. So um, that's the single largest budget increase. Um, the SLIFE, just for, I know there's an acronym below, but that's, we're having an increase in students who are ELL students, but it's not just the English language learner needs, it's that they have been, had interrupted schooling. So either coming from a place where school was half a day long or um, the refugees who did not have the experience to be educated for years on end, or uh, they were living in war torn places and, and for that reason they didn't have schooling. And so traditional ELL services, English language learner services, aren't actually what the students need. They, they need subsidy, substantively different because it's not just about the language skills, it's actually there's a gap in content that we need to fill. Uh, one of the things we're proud about, I just got back from Amherst Media filming around it, which is expanding our restorative practices program from, uh, we started last year in the, or two years ago in the high school and expanding it to the middle school environment so that we have a practitioner supporting um, restorative practices, which is an approach that's trying to stay away from the traditional disciplinary uh, model where there's not learning involved to way where harm, to, to interacting and resolving conflict in ways where um, human beings are preserved and actually the real issue is resolved. Um, we have a number of other positions that um, we're aware that this good times of our budget season won't last. Um, so some of these are places where we could have uh, one year positions. So one of those is a grade six through 12 math curriculum training and support. We'll be talking about that in a couple hours or regional school committee meeting. Uh, so we are looking to change the curriculum, the math curriculum and we do know that our staff need support in that adopt curriculum adoption. So we're looking at that as a one-year position that can come off for next year. Similarly, uh, the contribution to capital stabilization, we'd love for that to continue, but it's, if we have next year is not as strong fiscally as this year, uh, we know that, that that money will be there for capital projects, but uh, we don't necessarily need to bank on it for years on end. So we're trying to be thoughtful in our planning to know that uh, we won't have this level of health insurance savings year to year. Uh, just one other one I think I'll, I'll speak to is um, the bilingual psychologist. So again, that's related to special education needs and who our students are, and that's really trying to replace some contracted service lines. Uh, if we can get someone on staff instead of contracting out, we feel like the quality will be better and we may actually yield a, a savings in the end um, because um, how much it costs to have a consultant do bilingual evaluations. So I think I'm open to any questions. I just wanted to do some highlights around um, the budget ads and reductions. Right, we'll keep going. So this is Lynn. Uh, Lynn? Hi. Um, I, sent a, I sent a little icon, but I don't know whether we've set up that way yet. Um, so my, one of my questions is really about the students that we um, pay to go out of the system and the students that pay to come in. And what is our real cost of those that pay to come in? And what is our real loss of those that leave? And I, I, you know, I think I'm more focused on those that come in. Are what we're getting for them actually covering the cost? Uh, hi, Lynn. Uh, Sean, I'll answer that question. Um, so there's a study that we had done, um, I think it was in 2014, and we hope to update it again soon. Um, but NESDEC, which is the New England School Development Association of School Some, Elementary yeah, Secondary Schools. That's one yeah, of those right. educational organizations. Um, they came in, and, and they do enrollment projections. We work with them quite a bit. Um, but they came in and did an analysis of our school choice program. So that's, in terms of what you're talking about, it's primarily the school choice program where students come into the district. And what they looked at is um, what is the cost to those students that are coming in. I think at the time we had probably somewhere between 90 and 100 school choice in students. And so they analyzed what was the cost on the system from those students and then compared that to how much tuition we were bringing in um, to say, you know, are we operating an efficient school choice program or not. And so at the, that time they had estimated the cost to be a 0.6 FTE, um, which essentially when they looked at um, 
the, the uh, class sizes and things like that, and they backed out you know, how many choice students were in and could we save classes and things like that. Um, they, they narrowed that down to a 0.6 FTE, which is about thirty-six dollars to $40,000 a year. Um, so there, there's some other marginal costs, but in terms of the, the real sort of staffing level costs, that's what they had estimated. And for those students, we bring in um, $5,000 per student, and then there's a special education increment on top of that. So if a student comes in with special education needs, we get additional funds as well. Um, so for 100 kids, 90 to 100 kids, we probably brought in between five hundred dollars and $600,000. So at that time the report was done, they had said our school choice program was very efficient. Um, but that's one of those things that we do have to monitor because that can change. Um, as our enrollments, enrollments continue to decline, uh, it's just something we have to monitor to make sure it's still efficient going forward. Um, so that's the school choice piece. Um, and for tracking other costs in terms of out, we, uh, like charter tuition, invoke tuition, we just have accounts that you can um, see that. And we, in our full budget, there's an informational section which has the enrollment where you can see, see how many kids are going out of district for those reasons. Can I, I just ask when, if you went back and looked at it, did they or do you, when you look at the choice in groups, look specifically at the kids who come in? So if someone comes in and you're getting some extra for special needs, but this is extremely high need, um, so that is looked at when they're doing? Yeah, so we do something called the school choice claims every year. And so for the students that are coming in, we complete uh, our special education department helps complete an individual claim for those students that have special education needs. So it is specific to the students. Yeah. So because we have a lot of new counselors who have not been through this before, could you just for a second um, remind us of how many people, how many students are coming into the region as choice students because they were in elementary and what are we doing as far as taking choice directly into the region? Yeah, so uh, all four of the member di uh, towns, elementary districts, take choice students. Um, so you have Pelham, which has about 35, 40% of its students are choice students. And the way the laws work, once you're a choice student in a district, you follow that district, even if the districts change, that residency, uh, they're treated the same way. So the vast majority of the choice students we have at the region, uh, like that are coming into seventh, eighth grade, they were, that we don't have a choice of taking them or not. I'm not suggesting that there's not value in the students who come or the choice program. Uh, we, we actually don't take a tremendous number of choice students. When we do, it's often at seventh and ninth grade because uh, those are the transition grades where it's a little more predictable uh, or a little more unpredictable on the front end because some students come back from other private schools, charter schools, and some students go. Uh, that's been what we've done. We haven't taken huge numbers at those grade levels. The vast majority are coming from Amherst, Palm, Leverett, and Shootsbury Elementary schools, um, as they're entitled to do, uh, entitled to do. And, and the other thing I think I'd note is tonight, at our school committee meeting, we'll be having that uh, final report from JCJ, who looked at, you know, could sixth grade fit in the middle school, could seventh and eighth grade fit in the high school, and so we want to think about choice in a larger context too. Of what are our buildings? What's our enrollment going to be? Is there going to be any adjustments based on the enrollment, based on things going on in all four member towns? something we take really seriously and, and it's, a, it's a good question because particularly at this moment in time we want to be uh, hawkishly looking at that as we may be considering decisions about what students are educated where, or at least considering decisions in the next few years. Dorothy. I, I'm sure I did not understand um, what you said about the costs. Um, you said it, was, it cost each one who came in Thirty-six to 40000 That can't be right. I'll, cl I'll clarify, sir. So what NESDEC looked at was the total cost of all the choice students that were in the region. Mm -hmm. And they estimated that total cost to be the thirty-six to 40000 And then so what was, what was the total cost of what you um, got from tuition? In terms of the revenue that came in? Yeah. So I, can't, I don't remember that specific year, but we get $5,000 per student. So if we had 100... Um, 100 students, I think that's $500,000 roughly there. Um, I don't know if that math is right. I'll have to double check the math. But, but in general, we get between five hundred and six hundred thousand dollars and $600,000 a year when our enrollment floats between 90 and 100 students that are choiced in. Mm -hmm. So again, so the... So it's the, an advance, then you're coming out on top. That was the conclusion at that time. But again, um, it's just something we have to monitor because the enrollments change over time. Yeah. I think. The only thing I'll add is that our choice waiting list is long. 
Um, and you know, I just I, I say that because I want to be deliberate. Um, I want to make sure that the council knows that the finance committee knows we're very deliberate in how many students we take. It's not um, all comers um, because we're really conscious of class sizes, the experience of our students have, and also being efficient with our staffing. So we look at certain grade levels based on the number of students we have. We say, well, that grade level could accommodate 10 to 12 more kids in seventh or ninth grade. There's other grade levels I can think of last year where we just said, you know, based on the number of students we have, we, there's not really space. If we added more students, that would we need to add staffing, and that's sort of been our, the long before I was in this role, but just a very consistent methodology the district has had of we only add, we fill empty seats, we don't create seats. Um, and so that's been the approach and it continues to be so. And on the flip side of choice in, we monitor choice out um, because school choice we feel is like a good bellwether for how the school district is doing because it's choosing between different public school options. Um, and so we have roughly 90 to 100 kids who choice in with a wait list and on the choice outside, it's usually between 20 and 30. Um, again, that's been going down the last few years, down to I think the low 20s, might even be under 20 at this point. Um, so our choice out is relatively uh, low. Does that include charter kids? No, no, this no. is just, so that's yeah, it? just school choice, so charter. public school programs. Yeah. All right, so the next two pages, I won't spend a lot of time, I just wanted to make you aware of them. Um, we also include in the budget um, summary tables on the grants that we get. So these are state and federal grants and some private grants. So if you ever um, are curious who's given us money, this is one area to look. Um, and that's broken down into payroll accounts and expense accounts as well. Um, just as a general uh, observation for, for the region, our largest um, grant is the Special Education IDEA grant, which is a, an entitlement grant from the state um, to support special, or from the federal government actually, that goes through the state to support special, special education students. Um, and we have a few other grants, but that's the largest. And then the next page um, is a summary of our revolving funds. So school districts have a number of revolving funds, which are basically special purpose funds that track um, monies that come in for specific purposes. So um, athletics is a good example. The athletic program charges participation fees. Those participation fees, um, gate receipts for events go into a revolving fund. And then that revolving fund pays for some of the costs of the athletic program. So coaches, officials, um, some supplies and things of that nature. Um, another one is our food service program. So again, we collect federal and state reimbursements and, and fees for lunch from families. And that goes into a revolving fund and pays for the staff who run, uh, work in the program and the food and all, all that stuff. Um, so we have a number of those and those, again, the, the major ones are listed here. Yes. Um, it's just kind of weird looking. Under food services in FY 16 and 17, you got 14,000, then it jumps up to 308. Yeah, so I'll start and, and my. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so we decided back in FY 17 to bring our food service program back in house. So we went from contracting out all of our employees through the Wit through Witsons. So that cost was down in the expense section. So if you look at food services, down in the expense section, you'll see a corresponding drop. In that same year where it jumps, you'll see a drop on the expense side. And that's because we went from contracting out to the program being in-house and hiring our own staff. So when we made that switch for FY18, all the staff came onto our payroll and that cost to outsource it went away. Um, and the first year was very successful. Our, our cost, so we measure success from a financial perspective in terms of how much we have to subsidize the program each year. So you know, however much money is brought in, what we have to pay to provide the meals, and there's usually a gap every year that the operating budget has to fill in um, because you can't, none of these revolving funds can end the year in a deficit. And so that amount that we had to basically fill in went from, I think it was about $220,000, um, I can get you the exact number at some point, $220,000, $200,000 in FY17 um, down to the low 100, 120, somewhere in that range. Um, so that first year, the program being in-house was very successful, and it looks to be continuing that trend this year, um, but we're, that's a, one program that we're monitoring very closely because it's in the second year that it's been in-house. I was just going to say um, that it came from a lot of popular interest in having in-service, in-house food service and having more control. And the non-financial side, I know it's a finance committee meeting, but um, has been, um, not surprisingly, they go hand in hand, has been very positive in terms of the response to the food service program. So I think it's worth noting that. 
So I was going to transition to the capital budget, which is on the next page. So the school committee approved one capital request for FY20, but it's a relatively large one. It's the $3 million for the middle school roof. We have applied to the MSBA through their accelerated repair program to try to get um, partial reimbursement for this cost. And we'll find out sometime over the summer whether we were accepted into that program. So um, when this would actually, when the town of Amherst would actually start paying this would be a couple of years down the road when we, once the project's completed and we've gone out to borrow for it. Um, but this is the, the project we're hoping to complete, probably not this summer, but the following summer, depending on the timing of um, if we get the, into the MSBA program. Well, does the grant pay for 50 percent if you if it's awarded? Somewhere in that range. It's not exactly 50, but they'll pay for whatever reimbursement rate they determine based on our um, and then district. you calculate the Amherst share based on the net on, on yeah. your, your formula. So does that will that be coming into the FY 20 town capital budget as a guesstimate on the Amherst share? It wouldn't be in the FY 20, I don't believe yet, because the, the town's not probably going to be paying that in FY 20. Um, probably the earliest you would actually make a payment on this project would be FY 21. But in general, the regional debt um, from these projects that are approved is in the JCPC. It's in right. the projected and debt I section. I was just really asking about is it FY 20 or not? So you're, I don't you're, think it'll be best, FY 20. Because it, it yeah. hasn't shown up yet, but you're saying that you're going to, you think you're booking it for FY 21. Yeah, it depends on the timing of when it gets completed. So if we get into the MSBA this summer and we can do the project by the following summer and, and then go out and get, uh, borrow for it and then start us. Because the way the process works is we complete the projects. We use um, temporary borrowings of anticipation notes um, to pay for the projects as we complete them. And then once they're completed, if it's a large enough project, we'll go out for a bond and convert it to a long-term debt. And then once it's converted to long-term debt, we assess the towns for the annual debt payments. Um, so that process can take a little bit between um, just how long we do the, the temporary borrowings versus when we convert it to long-term bond and, and the timing of that. Um, and if we don't get the MSBA money this summer, then there's also a question of do we reapply for the MSBA the following summer or is, is the situation getting bad enough with the roof where we just have to do it? Um, so this $3 million is for the full cost of the roof. Um, and it also includes some, we're not sure, quite sure yet if it's enough, but it includes some amount for um, strengthening the roof at the middle school to be solar ready so that if um, the state comes out with new solar pro uh, incentive programs that we would be eligible to put solar panels on the middle school roof. Um, so this is the full cost. So the, the net, if we do get into the MSBA, the cost of the town would be lower. I'm, I'm get, I know I'm getting in the weeds a little no, bit okay. here about the roof, but um, if you move the sixth grade up, I saw some plans on where the classrooms might be, and some of them don't have windows, but there was a question on whether if you're replacing the roof, you could put skylights in, so that would be part of a consideration when you do a roof. It is, so you, you all should welcome to come tonight at 6.30, <laughs> right. your whole presentation, no, no, yeah. but I'll, I'll give you the preview of it, which is fine. Um, so skylights are not the option that uh, any facility director likes, frankly, because they leak. You will see in the Amherst budget, we've asked sure. for funds. Yeah, no, I wasn't suggesting you do them now. Oh, yeah, no, no, absolutely. But one of the things the architects have talked about, and we had a facility advisory group of community members who advised that process, was um, what's called sky tubes. So some people have them in their homes. They're, uh, they're certainly the cost structure could fit within what we're talking about. Um, the initial estimate that'll come out is, I think it was 50, $67,000 to put 57 of them in the interior spaces. Um, that really, sh we should be thinking about whether sixth grade comes or not, because you know there's still students in those spaces without natural light. Um, so that'll be talked about tonight with a nice uh, visual um, that the architects have used from another school where they, it was an ad right now project and they wanted to add natural light. And so from a leaking perspective, they function much better than skylights. Um, and from a cost perspective, they're certainly well within, I mean, I don't want to say drop in a bucket, but $3 million compared to 60 some odd is um, certainly something that I think is worth considering. Okay, I think Lynn has a question. Lynn? Lynn, I think you, you're, did you put a thumbs up, Lynn? Okay, uh, I had to unmute. Uh, so let me understand this. The money that you're asking of JCPC is on case you don't get the money from the state? 
So we're not asking JCPC at this point for any funds for this. Um, again, the, the way this goes into JCPC is um, it, it comes in as debt, essentially. It's not a prod, the regional um, plan is not considered as projects. It comes through as debt um, because of, I really think because of the arrangement between the four towns and how um, the approval process works is that if it gets approved by the four towns, then the member towns are obligated to pay for it at that point. It's not a, a request type thing. Um, so it, when it eventually comes into JCPC, it'll come in, if it's approved, it, it will come in as debt, not as a specific project request. Okay, I guess the question, that, and Andy, you might be able to help me better understand. We're going to bring this up as part of our hearing on the regional school budget, correct? We are. Um, the regional agreement, John, or Mike can explain this too a little bit, but if need be, but there's a provision in the regional agreement that requires that the regional school committee notify each of the member towns when there's a proposed expenditure for capital. And there's a specific period of time within which um, communities can uh, go through a procedure which historically has been uh, the select board deciding that it wants to put it onto a town meeting warrant and then town meeting has the choice as to whether it um, wants to object. If it doesn't act within that specific period of time, then um, the uh, proposal goes through and it is uh, assessed, a portion is assessed to each town according to a formula that, that's established in the regional agreement, which is different from the formula that we discussed at the Fort Towns meeting that pertains to operating budgets. Um, the other thing that I'll note, and then turn it back over to our guests, is that um, in my recollection, for all of the years that I've been involved in finance committee in the old format <coughs> and on the select board, I can never recall a select board in Amherst or in any of the towns actually referring at the town meeting that there's just agreement to um, accept the um, assessment as a reasonable and thought out process that was achieved through a four town process. And uh, so I don't recall it ever happening, even though it's provided in the regional agreement. Uh, we are in a new realm and we haven't quite worked it all out, but um, I think that uh, what we kind of are at right now is it really is a council decision. There is no separate select board to put it on a town meeting warrant. Yeah, and just filling in the specifics, so it's 60 days from the date that school committee votes, authorizes the debt, that the towns have to act on it. And if no action is taken within that 60 days, then it's basically approved. Um, and so I, I, like Andy, since I've been here, even before I was in this role, um, I don't believe it's ever been brought up at town meeting. I think be, in large part, I think it's because it's usually presented at the four town meetings and we get um, feedback on, uh, on the capital plan at the two four town meetings and try to craft something that is um, supported by the officials from the four towns. Um, but, that, but in terms of the, the timeline, it's 60 days. And so we always have that vote yeah. within 60 days of the annual town meeting. So people, so the, you know, Amherst in the past and, and the three smaller towns can consider it at their annual town meeting if they want to. And so the 60 days would be up later in April, I believe, or is it early May, but it doesn't. March 12th to April 12th, so rough, it'd be sometime in May. Um. So, uh, um, what I had suggested was that um, the topic be eligible for consideration at the regional hearing, just so that the um, council is aware, but um, I think, uh, um, you know, I, I, I'm not inclined personally to recommend that we take action, but I think that it's important that council understand the process. Thank you. And <laughs> that was very helpful. 
And the other thing you'll see on the capital plan, um, just because it may look funny, is Summit Academy renovations. Um, this is a project that the school and town uh, took on together back when the school was still, um, when the school district was still using Summit Academy, and we agreed to pay the town back over 10 years for some work that was done back then. So um, even though we're not there, we, we feel it's the right thing to do to continue to pay the town back for those costs. Um, and the next page, I'll, I'll try to go a little quicker. The next page, this just gives you what your debt assessment is. Um, so for FY20, the, the way this chart works is the top half where it says debt schedule and debt expense, those are our obligations that are outstanding. So right now the region has a bond for projects that were approved between FY13 and FY15, and that's the principal and interest on that bond. We have bond anticipation notes for projects that were approved between FY16 and FY19. Um, and because those projects were relatively small, we're probably just gonna pay back the notes and not convert it to a bond because it just doesn't make sense to uh, do that over long term. And then we gave you an estimate for planning purposes um, for the roof. So you can actually see here I have it in FY22. Um, and you can see what your assessment, so right below the debt expense, you'll see the assessments of the towns. So for FY20, Amherst is 294,160. Um, and if you wanted to see what the impact of the roof would be if the full three million was expended with no MSBA reimbursement, that's what it would climb to in FY22. And so the, the assessments of the towns are at sort of a lower point in history. Um, I'll share with you the sort of a full, fuller history of what debt assessments have been to the towns over the years, because um, I think it helps give you a, a greater picture of sort of the capital investment because really most of the capital for the regional school district is through this um, mechanism. So that'll help give you the context of where we are in terms of historical spending on capital. And then the last page, just because I know it comes up sometimes, is OPEB. So other post-employment benefits, um, the region does have a trust fund established. We have been uh, making investments into that trust fund. We have a standing line item in our operating budget for about 90,000 that's gonna climb every year um, for the foreseeable future. Um, you can see our liability is quite large, just like the towns, it's uh, 57 million. Um, and our fund balance in the trust fund is in the $200,000 range, but um, just in case you get asked, the region is uh, funding, trying to fund as much as it can um, and putting money aside for that purpose. And that's it. Questions? Well, we really, really appreciate it, and I um, uh, thank you for coming. I, we'd, uh, since we'd asked you to come on the 4th for the hearing, I'm um, very pleased that you're here to give, you, give us the preview. Um, I guess uh, if you have anything that you would like us to distribute to the full council in advance of the hearing, we have encouraged the council to be there for the hearing on the 4th and have posted it as a, or will post it, I guess, it more correctly stated, uh, as a meeting of the council um, in addition to a meeting of the finance committee. And we've encouraged the entire council to attend, which we've, um, believe should be the um, last presentation that's necessary on the regional budget, but thank you. Go ahead, Is Dorothy. there some place here where, you're, where there's gonna be a problem? If people come to this hearing, are they coming to speak for or against something? Because I mean, uh, this looks like very professional and, and thorough and detailed and, you know, you're having a hearing. So what are people coming to say? So I think the only right predictor of the future is predictor, you know, you look at the past. We did not have public comments at our public hearing at the region. Uh, I don't think we had any public comments. And that's unusual for us. And part of that's that we're having a particularly, compared to the past couple of years, a particularly strong year. Um, so um, I can't predict that that will definitely happen, but I think that's the best predictor is who comes when, before the regional school district mm -hmm. passes it. Um, my experience, you know, also is with the four towns having a really successful outcome of four town meetings that also, um, we've been communicating frequently about this. We did more outreach this year than we've done in the past also in superintendent newsletters. This is the budget. This is when the budget hearing 
is um, Sean did a great job meeting with faculty and staff. I was able to attend one uh, to get their input, CPAC, a number of other groups. So I think what we're finding is that as we front load the feedback process, it, it's a good way to do it, but I think it also helps not um, have things come up later that were unanticipated. Yeah, and I'll just add in, in terms of increases to the overall budget, that's always something we're conscious of that the, the costs are going up um, this year because of the health insurance and the charter tuition. The, the increase in our budget is relatively low. Um, I think it's 1.8 or 2% or something like that, which is um, either at inflation or a little bit below inflation. So, um, one thing, I, if I have one second, I just wanted to quickly show um, you all and, and the, if we're on TV, the community, um, where they can find this information on the budget. Um, some of you probably know this, but um, so if you go to the ARPS website, go to departments, and then business office, um, there's a number of links here. One of them, you can click on any of the stuff, auto reports, uh, bid postings, you know, whatever you're interested in, but we have uh, budget information. And with our new website, everything is held um, on a Google Drive. And so you have budget documents, um, presentations, and reports. So um, reports are, we do quarterly reports every, um, every quarter, but every fiscal year for the school committee. So if you're interested in sort of how's the budget doing, the budget that's already approved, how are we doing with that budget, you can go to the quarter, quarterly report section um, and view those. And we update those typically right after we present them to school committee. Um, and then the budget documents themselves are here as well. Um, so if you go to FY20 budget documents. Um, you see we have the region one posted and the Pelham one posted. And I've got to get the Amher Amherst one posted because that was approved last week. Shame on me. Um, but I'll get the Amherst one posted as well. Um, and so if you're free to, again, go here whenever you want. If you have questions on anything, you can email or call and, and we'll answer. Yeah, I think that was really helpful. And, and you might um, have a reader's guide when you do the hearing too. Mm -hmm. The first time I went to search, sure. I found it, but it was like not here, not here, right, and then, right. yeah, and then yeah, I, have like a, I found the, a little the path. Yeah. tree on where to go. Yeah. And can I find there? I found some old documents, but if I wanted to know the total amount of money that flows out of our system to the charter schools, mm -hmm. um, where would you find it? Yeah. I, so is there a current number? Because I I could find it, so I'd go to the same place to find that number. Yeah, I'll just tell you real quickly what page it's on. I mean, if it's in the big document, I can find it. Yeah, so Sean, it's I on page 91 of the big document. Um, that's the other program section, and you'll see a few years of actual and then what's being budgeted. Um, but that's the vocational tuition, the charter tuition, the choice tuition are all on that page. So, so I know I'm not, um, I'm, it's your presentation and not mine when you do the, the public hearing, but I think the two points that really jump out at you, and I heard during the summer forums when the candidates were, people were shocked at that number. Mm -hmm. I heard people go, oh my, and then you've got this other number of the shortfall and what was promised but not given. So it makes a link back to the state where you say, you know, that uh, voices not just locally, but voices at the state level really matter. And it's not just our town, but it's particularly our town. So m this is here, but it's not like sure. a, a circle is around it with stars or something yeah. on it. But you know, making that point really strongly yeah, we um, is how well you're managing despite these shortfalls. Right. Yeah, we can do that. Thank you. Thank you. One, one last thing while you're on the subject of the um, links, and I actually, Sonia, um, to ask our um, IT department to follow up. When you go to the Amherst um, website under um, government and then budget, and um, there's a link to the school budget, it doesn't work anymore because I think it goes to the old version of the budget and that link needs to be updated. Right, that was the detective nice. work when I said, oh, well, that didn't work, <laughs> so let's try the school. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll get that fixed. I noticed that too, you said from the finance committee, um, what was that? There's the old versions? Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. The school does not. I just checked it right now. So thank you. Okay, well, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. And Appreciate it. See, see each other again. <laughs> see you again on the fourth. Thank you. So um, I think what I would like to do, because uh, we have one other person who's here, and that's Dave Burgess. And David, thank you. Yes. Yes. 
Um, so, welcome. So I think that there were two questions that came up in the discussion while we, we were hoping that you could come and we're very pleased that you were able to. Um, one is that there's several members of the um, committee who have been asking for a general question about how um, tax is um, calculated and um, if any of my fellow committee members want to restate it after I state it because I think I haven't done it well enough, please jump in. But um, sort of to understand on rental property and mixed use buildings how um, you make that calculation. And then the other question was um, whether there's any estimates, uh, estimates on the East Street School as far as what the um, sale value of it might be, what the, um, if there's any appraisals that would help with that, and also any information that might help um, sort of understand what revenue might be coming in, which is, of course, based on the, a little bit on understanding the first, but may have information that you just don't have. Right. Well, we'll start at the beginning. Uh, the uh, mixed-use properties are valued using the income approach to valuation. What we're going to do is we're going to find out what the income is for both portions, commercial and residential. <laughs> uh, so we're going to look at each portion, which is residential and commercial. And uh, we will take the total income from the residential portion and we will apply a uh, factor for vacancy. We always, in Amherst, we allow 5% vacancy. I assume that's always going to be that 5% vacant. Uh, and we'll take that off. And we will then assume that we're going to take a, a factor which is somewhere between 38 and 43% for operating expenses of the property. This is what we have been using. That will change if we're uh, working on some low income projects such as the Beacon property. It's going to be a little bit higher. Uh, that will give us a net operating income. So we subtract that, those two figures from the gross income, and that will give us a net operating income. And then we capitalize it, and we're using it at the moment in Amherst a cap rate of anywhere from 75 to 10.5% based on the property, or the quality of the property. Uh, and we do the same thing for commercial, but the expenses are a little bit less, and the vacancy is still 5%. So that is how we do it. Then we'll add those two figures together, and that's the total valuation to the property. If a commercial part of the building is empty, but in theory would be rented, are you they're still being assessed on it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Everything is assessed, whether it's empty or not. We always look at those properties. Can I, can I ask about an arrangement, um, I believe, um, up by where I live, I live in North Amherst, um, where the new development is coming in. The land is owned by one party, the commercial is operated by a party, and then the, the rental units. So would you be issuing two tax bills then, or does the whole thing get one tax bill? Good question. There's going to be two tax bills. There will be one for the residential portion, which will go to the Beacon Companies, and one for the commercial areas, which will go to the WD Coals. Okay, and then, then the, and I guess, can I segue to the East Street School to ask yeah. a similar questions? Uh, are you, wait, wait, Michelle, any wants to ask? I just wanted to know, what is the, is there an advantage of keeping commercial and residential, I mean, we don't separate between residential uh, and, and commercial properties, so is there any advantage to doing that? I assume you mean we don't have a separate tax rate for residential well, and commercial? I, I know the reason for that. Okay. Uh, but we are... Okay, so let me see, what was the question? Yeah, we're not separating out, like when we show residential properties, some of them are rented out and some of them are used by the owners. 
So right now, when we show residential property, we're just showing this lump sum amount. We're not separating the two. No. And so the reason we don't have a different rate for the two is because there's not enough commercial property Correct. to justify. But then, oh yeah, so my question really is, why are, is there any benefit to, why do we not make the residential that's for rent a commercial? Why is that treated as residential? We don't have any option. It's at the state that decides what's commercial and residential. And if it's used as a, com a residential property, it's residential. Except for hotels, they're com considered commercial. But uh, uh, apartment complexes are all residential. So, yeah. Okay, so, so I'll segue to my question. If the land that a building is on is owned by a public entity, a municipal government, and the building that is built on it is built by a developer. Um, you, you're, you can still assess the developer um, a tax rate even though the land is not being taxed? So yeah. I, I should ask as a question, can you still? <laughs> yes, we, we consider that a building on leased land. Yeah. So we, that is what we will assess the building owner for the property. Uh, and the land, obviously we're not going to assess the town. Sure. If you look at the North Amherst, um, the old school? Yes. Yeah. The old school, the, 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 now the daycare, the, the, they, pay, they would be, if they paid taxes, they would be taxable on the property, on the building alone, not on the residential, or not on the land. And the same for the new development on Olympia Drive. Would that be true if um, UMass had a commercial housing development on UMass land? I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm jumping into uh, a, a question that I know only part of the answer because I've seen other states you can do it, but I don't know whether you can in Massachusetts. It's really going to depend on what the state allows us to do when it comes right down to it. Uh, personally, I believe it should be taxed, but we'll have to see what happens when we get some private development on there. Yeah, we have a hotel sitting up there we have never been able to tax. I, you know, I, I'm going to have to figure out whether he was telling me exactly the situation, but I came up on a plane today next to a young man who said he was going to a privately owned training center on UMass property where they, they own the center. So I, I'm not sure he understood which piece of property, but they conduct training sessions there. Um, so I, I'll just track down what he was talking about, yeah. but it was for UMass students, but they were the trainers, um, sort of as recruiters and training people for jobs. Um, so I'm not aware of any property okay. like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that we have to look at right now is uh, UMass Boston, and because I think that they actually are ahead of us on setting up these. I, I really don't know. I wonder what's happening there. Yeah. Um, okay. Chalmers, okay. did you have something else here? So the, oh, the last piece is on the E Street, the piece of land. Um, when the presentation was made to us a week ago, they said that it's been determined that only part of the land can be built on because mm -hmm. another part of it is uh, very wet or wetland. And they weren't sure if we wanted to get a, a value, just a value from you on what you value it as, so we know what gift we're giving for affordable uh, housing. Would it need to be re-looked at to take into account that part of it can't be built on? Um, we, can, we can certainly do that, but I haven't, I had, no one's asked me to do it yet. I was a bit surprised when you were asking the question. Yeah. But yes, we can do that. We can take a look at it and give you an idea of what we think the value should be. Okay. Uh, obviously, if you're, going to, if you're going to sell the property, it might be a bit different. Okay, and so that would be a question that would have to come from us, Andy, then, or, you know, or, or the council. Yeah, if we wanted to put a, a number on it. Where it was left, of course, was is that the uh, council voted that they would not refer to us, which it was the benefit of saying that they were not expecting a report back. So I think that it, it then makes it optional for the committee 
as to whether it wants to, it has anything to report that they think would be helpful to the discussion, and so we will have to have that um, discussion before. And my understanding is it was we weren't going to influence a decision, but it's just we wanted to put a piece of of a value on it, on it, you know. So if we're entering in a deal, we say you're getting this much from us, and mm -hmm. it's more than zero. Yes, we can do that. That's not a problem. And also for uh, future, as we create guidelines for future such transactions, so we have a history of you know what has been done, and then we can create a process for when we're giving yeah. property away for affordable housing, what that's going to look like. Yeah. It, it's not a simple arithmetic for that reason. Paul? Yeah, we, a couple of years ago, we decided uh, Amherst College were looking for values on their property. Uh, so the values on the... Normal assessment prop, uh, based, is based on market value of properties. These are all special use properties that we're looking at here at the moment. And really for resale, the value is not very much. Uh, so we're using a replacement cost value on the buildings for these. Uh, that's basically an, almost an insurance value for the property. So not exact, not what it would sell for, so that's why they're quite high at 2.3 million. The high schools high, they're all high at the moment because they really wouldn't have a market. Right, it's more that yeah. maybe the acreage has the market that someone wants to knock the building on and down even, and build something on it, yeah. Yeah, and if someone wanted to knock the East Street School down, that's a big building. It's, it's a big, <laughs> it's a big, it's a big knockdown. Right? Yes. Um, in the minutes that we're going to get to later that I, that I took on the March 19th meeting, um, showed it to my husband. I said we were interested in finding the valuation of the land just so they would know the value of the gift. And he said something which may or may not be true. He said that evaluation is necessary for the recipient because they need that for their tax filing. Yes. So then, so then we do need to revaluate. Yeah, but the, the value they're going to come up with and what we give them, they're probably going to have an appraiser putting the value on it as well for their purposes, okay. for their starting point, for their tax purposes going forward. Mm -hmm. Our value of the gift is what we think it is, but then their appraiser is going to come up with what they need. So, I th okay. you know, we, um, if you have anything, I, I mean, we would in certainly report it to the council uh, on Monday, but uh, I don't know what I don't think there's a rush on it, you know, because there was also the question of this, what part of the land that did people even know it existed, so we don't want to put a price tag on it that is higher. It, you know, so, yeah, well, well, you, we, you've got the question, yeah. <laughs> we can probably come up with a value if you want it by Monday, because what I'll do is take a building site on the property and use that as the base value and go from there, and then the rest of it will put back as wetlands and backland. Uh, I'll talk with Mr. Zomaki, he probably has an idea how much of the land is wet, and we can work from there. Maybe we'll thank you. Um, so, were there other questions about how assessments are done that would be helpful to ask while we have the opportunity? And I think that the other thing you were alluding to, in, um, and I just say this to the committee as a whole, there is a tax classification hearing that takes place in the fall of every year in which the decision has to be made annually as to whether to keep the factor um, of, the differ of the distinction between commercial and residential at one, which is to say we're taxing them at the same rate. And um, in that document, um, which is available on select board page for that particular meeting um, and can be easily found and sent to you if you're interested. 
it does it explains what the um, effect would be on the tax rates for homeowners, which would be very small, and what the effect on uh, commercial properties, which we have an interest in promoting within the town, which would be very high because of the large percentage of our property that is in fact residential. And uh, if anyone's interested in the details of that, um, the best document is one that I th think our guest today actually probably writes, but it's actually issued by the assessors. No, uh, I, I read it. I know you. That's all mine. <laughs> <laughs> I know you did. I appreciate it. And it's very clearly set forth every year as to what the current estimates are for what would be the effect of change. And uh, the, the ultimate conclusion that select board always came to, I can speak to it from that side, was that the benefit to our homeowners is so negligible and the penalty to our commercial properties is so great that it wasn't something that we would fairly consider. And uh, I think that there are a lot of communities that are in the same place. Well, now that you've clarified that uh, apartment houses will be residential tax by state law, we don't really have that big a question, do we? Uh, no, it, it's, it's just the commercial part. The, the restaurant is still done as commercial, so some towns do a differential tax rate if they have a substantial enough commercial uh, because they're making a lot of money. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, you get to make it in the future. Um, anything else? I'm just looking around. Okay. Thank you. So oh, thank, thank you. you very much. This has been thank very you. helpful. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So the, you want to break break? Sure. Then we'll take. Take, take a brief break right now. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is um, ask our town manager to speak with us briefly about some aspects of the budget document so that um, to help us um, understand how the budget document is structured. So at the table, uh, saying this for Lynn's benefit, is that um, Paul and Sonia are now uh, ready to make a presentation which involves a small number of slides. And so let's, this is under FY19 budget review. So, so it, we're hoping that you brought your budget, which would have, it was in your big binder. And that's I the- I did. That's the I didn't bring a binder, but I brought the thumb drive. That's good. <laughs> So, um, so that's your FY19 budget. It's the document that the town manager would hand over to the finance committee. And then that's the document the finance committee would work from when it was evaluating the departmental budgets and everything that was presented. Um, so that's the document. And what we wanted to do just quickly today was to orient you to what that budget looks like. So what, what, what are the components of that budget on the pages? So I think Sonia is going to walk you through that. I'm gonna try. Okay. So um, the budget book and what, what are the contents of the budget book? This is the town manager's chance to tell the story of the town. And in the book, in the beginning of the book, you'll find the transmittal letter or um, the town manager letter which shows the big picture through the town manager's eyes. And we have the finance committee and select board guidelines in here as well. Really? Okay. So we have the um, guidelines from the Finance Committee and the Select Board as well in this book because this is 20. I think we have it in, in the 22. Okay. Okay. Then we have um, forecasting charts in the beginning of the book which include charts and graphs showing revenue and expenditure history, as well as FTE history in charts in the front of the books. And you can see the FTE history on page, um, 
Yeah, XBI is 16. And 17. And then starting on page two of the, of the uh, budget book, we have history of revenue sources. So this tells you over time um, what our revenue sources were back to 2015. And it has, um, has state aid and it has the chart in front that shows the three major sources. What this chart doesn't have is other financing sources, which would be if we took money from free cash or ambulance receipts, that's not here. But the continuing pages has more detail. It has the detail of property tax. It shows you the, how the levy is calculated and in, back to fiscal year 15. It shows you local receipts detail. On page six, you have a lot more detail on local receipts. So it shows you how much we're taking in for motor vehicle excise and all the other categories under local receipts. Then it has state aid, the chart of what our state aid is over time. And then um, the, the numbers chart on page nine that shows the amounts that we have taken in over the years. And then we have, then we go into our expenditure side. Sorry. Which starts on page 13 and there you have pie charts of expenditures by type and then expenditures by functional area. And this is for the town operating budget only. So it's not the overall town budget which includes the schools and the and the uh, library. And then on page 14 and 16, it, it gives you more detail on expenditures by department on there. Sorry, I'm trying to adjust between my glasses and <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and then we go to the budget document itself. Turn my notes. And this, um, t the next couple of pages will tell us what's our purpose. This is departmental pages and it'll tell you what is our purpose, what have we accomplished, what's next, and performance measures. So you have the mission statement. And this tells us what is our purpose. It tells. Then we have the recent accomplishments and current challenges. Recent accomplishments and current challenges could include um, things such as, I'm gonna use the IT department since we have the IT department up here, participated in negotiations for renewal of a 10-year contract with the Amherst Media. That's one of their accomplishments. The challenge might be managing many large projects in a timely manner while maintaining the current IT infrastructure as one of the challenges. Then we have long range objectives. And examples of this would be to maximize the town's ability to provide services online, which is something they're always striving to do more of. And then next year's objectives, what do we wanna do next year in the budget? Um, one of their objectives was to upgrade the police department's internal video recording system or to upgrade the audio visual equipment in first floor meeting room as an example. And then we have the performance measures or service levels, which each department or each page where the departments have a lot of different information. It's interesting to look at and compare over the years. And then um, this page gives you the budget numbers. This will give you the history and change from previous year's budget. What does it cost for benefits and how are we paying for this department? And how many FTEs? What are we spending money on and what has changed? So you have the major appropriations. This, this is the budget for the department, the history of the actuals, and then the comparison of the previous year's budget to the budget that we're proposing. And it'll show you any significant changes. 
this top part where it says total appropriations, this is, this is um, the main focus of the budget. These numbers that are here are, are very accurate and I'd say almost set. I mean, anything can change up until the budget's voted, but these numbers are pretty well set. When you get below to supplemental information, where the benefits and capital is, anything below that is just that supplemental information. This uh, employee benefits shows what it cost for benefits in this department. We don't appropriate it in this department, that's just appropriated in the general fund budget under benefits, but this gives you an idea of what it costs. And this also includes retirees, so it's also showing, um, like when I retire from the finance department eventually here, in the finance department there'll always be a figure in there for me for paying out my retirement benefits, or my employee, um, health insurance benefits. Oops, I forgot to talk about the capital. The capital that's in here is what the departments put in their budgets to begin with, so we won't really know what the capital is going to be in, for another few weeks here until the capital budget's been approved, and so the numbers that are in here are what they asked for at the time. So these numbers will change, but it gives you an idea. And then we have the, so whoops, I'm one too many here. The source of funds, this shows you an approximate idea of of the funding sources for this department. This also changed, this is one thing, until the tax rate is set for a fiscal year, these numbers can fluctuate because there's a huge calculation that happens with the recap and we sometimes have to adjust um, some of these figures that are in here, especially local receipts. And then the FTEs, this tells you how many positions are in that department and what we're paying for. And then the explanation of major budget components, which means what are we spending our money on? Personnel services, relicensing, and it gives you a good idea of what's going on here. And then if there's any significant changes in the budget, it would show up right here. So um, if funding changed for people, like I know in IT for fiscal year 20, we budget, we have uh, one employee that's half paid out of IT and half paid out of public safety because he was doing all the public safety work. We are moving that money over from public safety and putting it into general services so he's gonna be paid totally out of IT. So you'll see a big increase here for half a position, but you'll see a decline in, on public safety side. So this kind, that's the kind of thing that would be put in the significant budget changes for an explanation. And then further in the back of the book, you have um, our debt and interest section that shows our debt service for that year, just the principal payments and interest in the general fund. And so there's a few pages specific to that. And I'll, let's see, page 115. That. And also, we have other expenditures, what our OPEB payment is, what our um, reserve fund, if we're still doing reserve fund for fiscal year 20, I, don't, I believe we are not. We have other assessments, which page 120 shows all the state assessments over, over the years and from last year's budget. And there's the county regional lockup assessment, the Pioneer Valley Planning Court co-op, and then the retirement assessment over the years. And then we also have the pages for our enterprise funds, which show all the same detail that we see in the um, general fund, it'll show the revenue sources and the expenditures, it'll show the debt, and there's uh, revenues, what types of revenues, how much we've collected over the years, and then what our expenditures are gonna be, including our indirect costs that are charged to the um, enterprise funds. And then we have the appendices, with have, which have a lot of useful information in there. There is debt service, the full debt, not debt service, but um, outstanding debt lists in there. There's revenue collected in there over years. There's 
expenditure types through the years. There's all of our grants, what we're taking in for grants for that year. So there's a lot of information in this book. And I think that's it. Sorry about that, I was a little No, little that's okay. I, I had some questions. Um, so on, I'll, I'll try to organize them. Um, on, first on enterprise funds. Um, if they take on or they need a new capital expense within the enterprise fund, does the enterprise fund itself finance all of that, or is there ever a point where part of it is taken up by, by the town? So I mean, I've got two questions that are linked to this. And when those decisions are being made, is that coming up to you as the town manager? If, if something needed to be happening, whether it's a new waterworks, a new something you know, in the future, would that come to the town council? You know, what, what, what's the flow of decision making on it? So, so you are, the town council is also the board of water and sewer right, commissioners. Right. So you would see it in multiple ways. One would be, do you want to appropriate funds to do this as the board of water and sewer commissioners? But also if there's borrowing uh, that's entailed, that would be required vote, a two thirds vote by the town council. Um, and this would also, uh, be shown in the um, budgets that you would see from the various enterprise zones, enterprise funds. And, and this would somehow, we'd be alerted to some things on the, you know, it stays quiet for a while until something major needs to be addressed, or would there be an annual time we're looking at enterprise funds? I, I know we're in the new world here. So, so. No, the enterprise yeah. funds will be looked at, and it's one of the things we've, I've been thinking about, I haven't talked with the chair about this yet, is how do we educate the council about the enterprise funds? Because that's happening at the same time as the regular budget. And that's why it's included in your budget. Uh, it's included in the budget book. So we have a day that's sort of reserved for reviewing DPW and at the enterprise funds where there are four of them. And so you, typically you would go through them each, okay. the water, sewer, transportation, and um, trash. Solid waste. Solid waste, <laughs> Solid waste yeah. Okay, so, so that, that's helpful. And then for the most part, if, am I right that if it was a major capital investment that needed to be made, it would somehow be financed within the enterprise fund? Yes, okay. and yes, by the water, it, it, depending on where you sure. look for the source. If it's for transportation, you'd say, where is the money coming from for a transportation project? Yep. Um, transportation mean, means basically parking, downtown parking, really. But it's one of the things we were, I was wondering about if, if the council wanted, before you get the budget, a time just to talk about enterprise funds because it's I, not I something we've touched on. I think it'd be useful because you know even on you know the issue that came up with the, if there was this potentially earmarked set of funds to do something to offset the bus cuts mm -hmm. and it's sitting in an enterprise fund, mm -hmm. so on a, I presume you've got the authority to release that money if you mm -hmm. decide there's a way to do it, and at what point decisions like that in the future would be coming to us because that's a decision that was made in the past in terms of setting aside that amount of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a town meeting decision. Right. But it's just not been clear to me that when would we even know if the decision had been made? Um, so that would have to be in the budget. So that what the town meeting did is they said, we want to take some money out of our, uh, I'll call it free cash for the tr transportation fund and put it into this function. So it took money out of the savings account and put it into this into this, um, into, into this purpose, basically. So, I, don't want to, I, I have mm. one that I'm about to get in the I'm weeds on it. something else, but. I just so. wanted to add a little um, to that money that was added there. It was added for this fiscal year only, this fiscal year 19 budget. So at year end, if it's not spent, it goes back to the free cash and the enterprise funds. It doesn't sit there until we decide to spend it. So it's like the federal government, whether it was use it or lose it. That right. It, well, we don't lose it. I, I know you it don't, goes but back. use it for that purpose. I mean, it doesn't, I didn't mean literally it disappears. Yeah. It yeah. goes back into <laughs> up for grabs. So I did, when I, actually, I made a decision to actually get more into the weeds than I had with this. So I went, I love these appendices that went through when we've gone out for debt service and what we're paying mm -hmm. off. And there was one I flagged, um, it's the pur purchase of the gas station up, um, that I saw at the, it's the only one that has a high interest rate. Um, 
and high as 4% as opposed to 1% and 2%. Um, someone is managing those so that you could make a decision, maybe that one should be, when can you refinance it that, you know, rates are in our favor, so how does that happen? I think at the time that this budget book was put together, it was just a projected amount. I mean, we use 4% and 5% when we project in years ahead, and we haven't borrowed yet, and we haven't actually gotten more narrowed in our borrowing. So that would have been a projected debt, but we would put it on there because we'd know we'd have to pay interest on a ban. So a, a, a ban is a bond anticipation note. Oh, sorry. Okay. So before you actually go out for a bonding, you can issue a ban, a bond anticipation note, where you would borrow the money for a short period of time, it's usually at a slightly higher interest rate, until you get an assemblage of borrowing that's worth it, that's big enough, that's worth it to go out to borrow. We don't go out for issues or for every $650,000. We wait until we have a substantial amount of money, and then we'll go out to the market and say, we have all these projects, we have 10 projects we'd like to put into permanent borrowing. That's where you get the competitive interest rates. Okay. You know, so, so on that one, what you're telling me, so, Sonia, is that was new enough when it went into this book that it may have just been a placeholder then? It, yeah. Because some of these are great. I mean, 1%, it, you, you'd like to get 1%, you know, and on the era that we're in. Yeah. But this helped me see what it is we're paying off. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's been that large number that we're paying off, but what are we paying off and when is it? about to be paid off. Mm -hmm. I mean, these dependencies are very useful. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah, um, so are, were you going to take over note taking now that Shalini's having to go? I need to get a transition here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the, oh, thank you. So uh, you, you had no questions on the way out? OK, thanks. Lynn, uh, Lynn, do you have a question? I'm seeing the word question. Right. Um, did we uh, take advantage of low interest rates and refinance at the time that they went down? Or we, were we already sitting at reasonably low rates? Um, we're not usually that um, quick to make changes. So once we issue a debt, we issue the debt and it stays there. We don't really go out and play the market like that. So um, when we're prepared, when we're prepared to borrow, we borrow, and it's it's sort of where we are at that moment in time. The, the reason I ask this is because it, the, the university, at one point, um, back when interest rates were really high, um, was carrying you know the usual amount of debt and took advantage of uh, the dive in interest rates that went on about. Eight, ten years ago, maybe even longer, and refinanced. And I was just curious whether or not the town did that at any point. I think the answer is that we did it uh, once, but I, I, my recollection going way back is that uh, John was town manager at the time, but mm -hmm. you would know Sonia. I'm pretty sure he was treasurer at the time, finance director, treasurer, and we, we've done some refunding. Okay, thank you. So, um, and I just want to point out to the um, committee that uh, on April 23rd, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into this question of uh, how the bond process works, and we'll have two guest speakers that day. It, I think there was some confusion because they're not the same topic, but they're actually two different people who are going to be talking about the two different subjects. Um, that are involved. I'll ask my question for the future then. Um, I've been attending all the JCPC uh, meetings and I've added up the requests and I understand at this point it's requests and uh, it adds up to substantially more, uh, not surprisingly, than what I can see is the amount if I take out the flow in and, and the debt service out. So at what point are you centrally deciding we're going to take on some of that because we're going to issue it as debt rather than try to do it 
you know, so the big one might be the fire in the new ladder truck if we decide to do it. So how, where in the process does that decision be that we've got four million to spend if we're just doing it, you know, cash versus take on debt? So it's part of a, you know, our, our financing plan, and as you, we've talked about many times, it's we're trying to reduce our debt load as we yeah. anticipate no, the. No, I, I realize that. So yeah. we're not real. I'm, you know, there could be an argument made that we should borrow money to invest in roads, for instance, and I would not support that. So at, at some point with JCPC or some, we, we we would present a plan. If we were, if we we're intending to borrow, we'd present a plan to the council for how that would happen. But it's, at this point, we're not looking to borrow. We're trying to live. We, we need to live within our means. Yeah, so, so their task or, or yours and their task will be get nearer to the amount of flow that we've got. We will get to that flow. We, we will get to there. Yeah. <laughs> There's no doubt. Yeah. <clears throat> this year, the um, process is going to be really different. And I think that we're really trying to figure out the process because uh, in the past, uh, the way it's worked is JCPC is sort of reporting both to the town manager and to the town meeting at the same time, even though the final decision as to whether to accept a JCPC recommendation really in the old form of government flowed to the town manager. Under our new form of government, uh, the Charter says what the Charter says, which is JC's PC is reporting to the town manager. And uh, I think uh, so we we have to figure out what it is that where else the report goes and how it's going to be worded this year, which is a different topic to, to think about. Um, but in the end, it ultimately is part of the town manager's budget under the Charter, and uh, so that the capital request, uh, which will be made based upon um, accepting or rejecting recommendations of JCPC, uh, is really within the purview of the manager. And that's at least my understanding of the charter. So yes. When does the town council, or does it, um, or does it? Does the town council go finance committee and then to finance committee to JCPC and then to the town manager, or does it ever come to a full town council vote? Um, well, it, it comes through the budget process. It will be included in the May 1st budget, and um, it will be part of the review process that I, uh, we will set up after May 1st. And uh, what the charter indicates is, is that uh, we can remove items as a council uh, or reduce items, but we can't increase or add items. And uh, I think that's uh, how that's going to work with something that we're all exploring. Yeah. You Kathy? No, I don't have anything more on this. Um, I'm ready. I don't know whether you want to do other parts of the agenda um, or. Well, the only other, yeah, I, I think we should uh, thank Paul for being yeah, here. No, and thank uh, you very much. If you need to get on, because we're going to talk just about, the, I think, about the committee charge and then get to minutes and uh, make sure we have our plan for additional meetings. No, and I really where, appreciate that you're, both of you are keeping, well, you can see you've been doing it forever, but keeping these history tables. I think that those are incredibly valuable to be able to see what's been happening over time. Thank you.
Are you all still there? Hello? Hello? Um, can anyone hear me? Hello? Okay. Hello? Can anyone hear me? <laughs> I'm gonna can, you try, can you hear now? I can now, thank you. Okay. okay. We, we lost all mics in here, Lynn. We yeah. heard you fine, but... Okay, so oh. let the record reflect. We just said about two minutes ago that we lost contact with um, the remote participant, but we are now back online. I think that we're, we're, we're running out of steam, and I, the one thing I want to do is talk about the committee charge piece. And um, th Kathy, thank you for having taken our work from last time and put it into an initial draft format for us to look at. Uh, and so I think the question, first question is in general, um, are we satisfied with our decisions about three resident counselors and uh, the uh, fact that it's going to be two year terms? And the, I am. <laughs> and the way that it is worded, is that all within agreement? Because I think that what we had said at the last time is, is that we were going to uh, then turn it back over to uh, the GOL committee and uh, Mandy Johanneke to make sure that it is consistent with her expectation. Um, well, I haven't, I know the format that she wants this in, and it's not quite there yet. I just stayed with the old format, so I'll get it closer. Um, so I guess, Lynn, the process, do you want to bring this to the council to see if they're in agreement with the substance of it and then have GOL uh, fine tune it to be in the new and better revised format for charges? Um, it, I'd like to bring it to the council if possible on Monday uh, and have them adopted so that we can get started on the process given that we only have April, May, and June to do it. Um, so I don't know, you know, again, I, I'm not asking, I, I don't think putting it into the general format is a big deal. Okay. No. Yeah, I don't so, think so. She's just they, got things in, are, yeah, she's got things There in. are certainly some changes. So I think we should bring it to the council on Monday and then have, if there's serious objection, then obviously it has to go back either to finance or GOL. But if not, then we can adopt it subject to the changes of GOL. Okay. One piece that um, we had the Rules Committee meeting earlier today. Um, yes. Actually, just before this meeting. And Alyssa pointed out that rules never reported out the decision to you know, kick it over to finance and do it this way. So she's writing up that report. Um, so she wants to close the loop on that. So I think she'll be doing a report for you saying this. Um, that's, I think that's irrelevant for this process, but she was concerned that finance went ahead and redid the process 
you know, redid the charge without it first going to the council and then coming back to finance. Um, so I'm fine with coming with the charge on Monday. You know, I can clean it up a little bit like the special, uh, the special municipal employees. I saw what Mandy did on one of the others and for the non-residents, I think they have to be. And there might be a typo too, but I'll just clean it up so it doesn't have track changes in it. I mean, you know, it has to have track changes from the original document, but you know, the missing pieces. The SME is actually a complicated issue that um, I raised in, uh, with uh, Margaret, and uh, she sent a memo this morning on the subject, and uh, it raises some serious policy questions that I wanted to hear back from uh, Lynn and Mandy on because the policy questions are bigger than the single committee. So uh, we given that, it. Andy, are you suggesting that since we don't have the answers on that, we should in fact wait till the 22nd? <coughs> well, we, we could adopt the rest of it in because we're trying to establish the principle about committee membership and the appointment process and um, indicate that the SME status and the final presentation will be uh, needing um, additional work and it will be presented consistent with uh, whatever the council decides on Monday regarding the reduction in the number of um, resident members and how they are appointed in their terms. And, and Lynn, we're looking at the document where you put in yellow, do we need um, something here on spe special municipal employees? We could just leave that yellow highlight when people are seeing it, that, that, right. that we haven't answered that question. Right. How do you want to resolve Alyssa's issue? Pardon? How do you want to resolve Alyssa's issue? I don't know. Um, she, she understood that when rules took a vote and we decided to do this process that I think she understood that we were coming right away to finance to suggest this so that we could discuss it. So she just felt that the, there had not been a report to the council um, and then the OCA group was hearing it indirectly um, rather than a vote by the council to use a different process for this inter set of interviews. So it's not an issue about us changing the number of people or the term, it's, it's the interview process that's at issue. Um, she, she wasn't objecting to that process, but, uh, but object at this point, because she knows she voted for it, but it was more Rules was supposed to report to the council so the council could say yes. <laughs> and then finance was supposed to have this discussion, so we have already had the discussion. And she was fine with it, by the way, with the charge. I said the charge talks about three rather than four and two year terms. You know, so it's, I probably should not put anything about what the interview process would be in the charge because that doesn't have to be spelled out. I would agree that that's true. Pardon? I would agree that that is true. You then, should not have put anything about the interview process. Yeah, so I can just take that part out where it would mm -hmm. be, you know, finance chair and or designee. So it just would right. be, we're looking for these kinds of skill sets. I can fix that part of the draft. Mm hmm Yep. So the suggestion is, is that we... Uh, make the change to the appointment section that Kathy just described and that we uh, otherwise leave it as it is prepared to report it back to the council on the 1st of April uh, with the further report that uh, the format will change and that we will need to come back with a answer on the SME status after um, getting comments from other committees. Right. And uh, did, 
I said you you were on the um, you should have received the copy of the email exchanges that went online. I did. I saw them and so, and understand the issue. So it's just a question. Um, I didn't feel it was a finance committee decision as to how to resolve that one. I think that it, that's why I was wondering I, where you wanted it to go before I made that decision. On the issue of whether or not the SME special issue. Committees. The committee has to either be listed one way or another. It can't have, you can't do it for some members, not others. That's what the opinion we have. Well, I think we have to go with whatever way the town council is already structured. So I don't think we can excuse or all of a sudden have the town council members on this committee be treated or seen differently than other than other committees that town councilors are on. The um, of course this is a unique committee because it involves members who are not members of the council and I think one of the questions that was posed was whether um, having uh, not having SME status for the committee, which would then apply to the citizen members, the resident members, whether that would discourage some resident members from choosing to participate. So what, what's your recommendation, Andy? I haven't had time to think it through and I was hoping for a comment from Andy. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and prepare it for Monday and see if we can get a comment from Mandy Jo uh, about that. Otherwise, we can always pull it from the agenda and take it to the 22nd. Well, we can always. Um, I think that what I would suggest is a motion to make the um, deletions from the appointment section in the draft that was presented for this meeting that relate to the process for um, the appointments, which is, I think the last sentence yeah. in that in that appointment section. Uh, there, there, there's a whole piece there that I can just, I, I've got the, as an example, uh, the way the new climate committee is set up, they have some criteria they're looking for, but it doesn't mention what the process is. So I'll fix that paragraph. So, the, the, so uh, with that amendment and um, the, um, our, that we presented to the council um, with the notation that a decision still needs to be made about SME status and it may be reformatted to uh, fit the uh, suggested template. That but, sounds good. So that, that, that uh, but that we otherwise are adopting said and agreeable. That's so I think, um, do we have a motion to that effect? I move uh, that we amend the appointment section to just list the criteria we're looking for um, and that we wait till later to determine the special uh, municipal employees. So I will leave this blank or to be determined later language I and get this. That. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded. Um, need to do roll call and for, because we do have a member who's not present and um, so I will try and do this um, alphabetically. Um, Lynn? Yes. And um, Dorothy? Yes. Kathy? Yes. And I'm uh, voting yes, so it's four to zero with one member absent. And just for people's information, I'm looking at the committee charge for the Energy and Climate Action Committee, where it's a mix of counselors and non-residents, and the way it's written there. So I will double check with Mandy. Is yes, 
on special municipal employees. It's yes for residents, no for counselors is the way it's written in that charge. So it's written in a mixed way? Yep. Okay. So I'm, I'm assuming, knowing that Mandy's quite thorough, that she did some work on figuring that out, but I will double check with her whether we should use that word or leave it at blank, as we've just said. Okay. Mm -hmm. Minutes. Okay, we've got uh, two sets of minutes that Andy read um, and made some edits on. Then one is from February 26th and one is from March 5th. Um, I sent them out to everyone. The only thing I, I did in addition is on Dorothy's. I just divided it into the sections that were on the agenda. So I just put one, two, three, four, five. Um, and I was hoping we could get those approved. I think, Lynn, you took minutes for the March 11th meeting. And, if, and I still owe you those. Pardon? I still owe you, you those minutes. Okay, so I haven't. I don't think we've seen those. And Dorothy has done a draft of last week's, but Andy hasn't had time to review it yet. So we're just looking at two sets of minutes right now, March fifth and February twenty sixth. Right. So, um, are there any comments or suggestions on February twenty sixth or March fifth minutes? None for me. Me. Dorothy? Um, no, that's fine. Okay. So I think that, uh, you know, we, we will need to make a decision in the future whether we need to do it by motion of the committee uh, because uh, we've been advised that we do not have to do that. Right. We, we were told when we were had the session with Lauren that it, we could adopt a process that we delegate the chair the, the review, the final review, and he can go ahead and approve. I mean, we've been doing it in a, a variety of ways. I'm waiting for everyone to at least make their comments. I'm, I'm fine with you doing that, Andy, or, you know, or me helping you with it. Whatever, we, I just feel like we could, some of these have been done for a while and everyone has kind of said yes, but we haven't had a way okay. of getting them over okay. the finish line. Okay, here's my suggestion. Um, somebody, I'm gonna make a motion to adopt the minutes of February 26th and March 5th as presented. I second it. Okay, so um, I'll just do the same order. We have a motion and a second, Lynn. And Dorothy? Yes. Kathy? Yes. And I vote yes. So it's four to zero, one member absent. Um, and then the for future meetings, um, does somebody want to make a motion to um, allow the chair to approve minutes for future meetings? I will make a motion to allow the chair to approve minutes for future meetings. I will second that. Okay, there's a motion that's been made and seconded. Uh, again, I have to do roll call and have roll call noted in the minutes. Lynn? Are you with us? Is Lynn still there? Uh -oh. Yes. Okay. Uh, Dorothy? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Yeah, I'll vote yes also. So again, it's four to zero with one member absent. Um, so the, um, going on to just real quickly, because it is four o'clock, uh, the next actions of this committee is, uh, next meeting is uh, April 4th for the um, joint meeting with the town council to do the uh, budget hearing for the regional school budget and um, other matters related to the regional school funding. And then um, our follow-up meeting, I believe, looking at the process, is it, we're not then to April. So we still have a meeting Tuesday in addition to the, yes. the hearing. Yeah. Uh, no, I did. We, do we have one? So we're just going to cancel 
April 2nd? I'm not showing us as having one on Tuesday. Yeah, I'm not showing us as having one on Tuesday either. Okay. So there is no meeting till April 2nd. Great. Okay. So um, I think that uh, I don't have much else to add. The um, there's no public here to comment. Let the minutes reflect. And uh, is there any other business that was not anticipated? 48 hours in advance, people would like to mention? None. Seeing none, then uh, I will consider that we have a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. I second it. Okay, Lynn? <laughs> Dorothy? Yes. 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 Lynn, do you want to adjourn? Yep. Okay, so it's four to zero, one member absent to adjourn at 410. Thank you very much, uh, appreciate it, and um, safe travels back. <laughs>